Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Future Friday, we're gonna talk about seaweed biofuel. So let's dive right into it. So what exactly is the need for us where we have to build about biofuel, which is made from seaweed? Well, the reality is we need energy for transport industry, basically mobile equipments. And this is what we call huge and compulsory sector, meaning it's not optional, it is not luxury item, it's something that you must have, meaning if these things stop working, everything else will stop working. So it's something very crucial, it's like a heart of, heart of our industrial world. So we have to have it. And industrial world and farming sector both consume fuel like there is no tomorrow. That's like ironically our primary fuel consumer. So we have to take care of them. And at this point in time, we have tried everything. We have tried CNG, we have tried uh, uh, LNG also in some cases. Uh, we have tried uh, basically LPG, we have tried uh, electric vehicles, uh, battery vehicles, everything, nothing works. Reality is at this point in time, all the knowledge all the data, all the realistic world experience we have, there is nothing that beats liquid hydrocarbon. Petrol is like, eh, okay, but diesel is good. And there is a even bigger brother of diesel, which we call kerosene, generally is even better. Generally, it's reserved for rockets and uh, jet planes. But diesel is one of those things where it's like, it's awesome. There is nothing that even comes close to replacing diesel's uh, oomph, diesel's main power. So that's why we need something that is equivalent to it. Now, whenever you think about this sort of thing, the first thing people say, oh, what, what alternative? We have to go from this, we have to go from this, and that. here's the reality of it. There is no alternate. We know this. We have experimented for past 50 to 60 years, and there is nothing that even comes close. The first thing people think about when in terms of fuel and heavy vehicles, we know for a fact that EV cannot even compete. So what about trucks and vehicles? They are like, how about we use hydrogen? Now, here's the deal. Hydro the Problem with hydrogen is that A, our government, and I mean every country government is generally filled by people who are neither engineers nor uh, scientists. They are basically lol people uh, who do, I don't even know what they do, but other than lol. So what does that mean? That simply means somebody smart can troll them and that's how they troll them. Hydrogen has 150 around megajoule per kilogram. That's awesome, that's true, that's factual, that's not a lie. Here's the deal. They forget something known as density, meaning one liter of hydrogen in normal atmospheric condition, standard atmospheric and standard temperature condition is nothing. It's light. It's basically it's a buoyant gas, meaning it will float upwards. It does not have weight to it. What does that translate to? That translates to if you have liquid hydrogen, the highest density format that you can practically uh, expect to use. It was used in rocket industry for a long time. It's eight megajoule per liter. Now that sounds good, that's like uh, at least uh, I think two times better than uh, current uh, battery systems. So that's good. Here's the deal, diesel is like 34 bitch. Eight versus 34, let that sink in. That's on liquid format and be mindful diesel can work in normal room temperature, standard system. You do not have to worry about it. It's like normal room temperature or atmospheric pressure. And to achieve eight megajoule, you need liquid hydrogen, which is one of the densest state you can achieve, which requires almost absolute zero. Good luck trying to find an insulator that works uh, on it for long term. And here's the, what does that translate to? That eight megajoule, 34 megajoule, what does it mean? That simply means if you are running a diesel engine, if it is around or exceeds 25% efficiency, basically energy to actual useful work, it's gonna beat 100% efficiency of hydrogen, meaning good luck trying to find a system of fuel cell or anything that is 100% efficient. But even if you are achieving 100%, let's say a hydrogen car is there, that's like 100% efficient somehow, let's say you achieve that. A diesel vehicle to compete against it, to bit slap it, all it has to do exceed 25%. Now, here's the reality of it. Modern cars can achieve theoretical of 40, as in like in test condition lab, like that's a real world achievable thing, but it's just real world conditions never line up. So real world actual driving condition is worst case scenario is 30%, practical good driving condition 35%. You already exceeded eight megajoule per liter. Energy cannot be created, not destroyed. If your fuel does not have it, you cannot outperform it. So that's the reality of it. That's why hydrogen, even though we have been building jets that work on hydrogen from uh, basically as early as 1980s, we have every time either uh, Soviet Union tried, every time a US Army tried, every time every Tom, Dick and Els Harry tried, they all come down to the same thing. It does not work. It does not have enough capacity. And why the heck Toyota is like still working on that hydrogen system? sunken cost fallacy. They burned through way too much money on it. So they are like, let's milk it. And it's very easy to sell to public. It's like, you know, it has 150 megajoule per kilogram. That's true, but it's just a kilogram of hydrogen is almost unattainable. Like you need, I think, around 11 liters of liquid hydrogen to achieve one kilogram of it. So that's the problem. That's why hydrogen always fails. We have tried it from long enough, like from 1960. Apollo mission used hydrogen as a fuel source. So we know for a fact that we have tried it, it's built, it just does not work. 
Now, what about EV? That's the second option you may think about. Here's the EV does not scale up, meaning even car is almost pushing its upper limits. So that's a scenario where you do not even think about because trucks have a weight limitation per axle wise. They cannot be like, you know, carrying 30 tons of battery itself. So there is an inherent limitation and don't even think about jumbo jet. That physics does not allow that. Now, there is a, my potential understanding, my uh, perception is that we have maximized the battery. We cannot go any further, meaning the chemical energy level is here. We are almost here in real world, meaning there is not that much left. Now, assuming with some magical hoo-ha technology like carbon nanotube, uh, graphene technologies and like assuming they really work, uh, does that mean we can achieve, you know, much multiple times? Because be mindful, we are at like four to eight megajoule uh, in terms of battery. What if we achieve like four times more than that? Here's the problem with that. That exceeds TNT level energy. Now, if you take petrol, if you take TNT, TNT has much less power. Now, like, wait a minute. Then why the heck TNT is boom potential? Because TNT is self-sufficient. Petrol has a limiting factor, meaning it requires oxygen from the atmosphere to do the work. And not to mention, atmosphere does not have 100% oxygen. It's diluted by nitrogen. So that's an inherent limitation. When you're talking about TNT, it has everything. It will go boom under water. It will go boom inside a naval shell. It is like, it's like, I got this. So that's why problem with uh, like, you know, whenever you're talking about something that has all of its component in itself, it's a boom powder, for example, batteries. That's why battery fires are so difficult to deal with because there is no external variable that you can control. You cannot choke the fire. It will burn on its own. So that at this point in time, we are dealing with battery fires and it's brutal to deal with it. Now imagine a battery that has five times more energy density than that. That will make TNT look like bitch please. So I really don't like that idea, uh, you know, literally solid explosives. I don't like that idea. So that's a physics based limitation. It cannot be. Now you need a battery. If that has that kind of power, it has to be absolute safe, which physics does not allow. Physics does not allow 100%. It only allows 99.9999. But that 1% would will not be like, oh, it uh, caused a you know fire. It will be like, yeah, it removed the building. So that's why there is no practical real world alternative at this moment in time. And I'm reasonably sure even for a few years in the future, damn sure about it. So what about biofuel? Biofuel has one core advantage, uses the exact same system and infrastructure, meaning we do not have to change anything. We do not have to change our cars. We do not have to change our manufacturing. We do not have to mine cobalt. We do not have to mine lithium. We do not have to worry about any of those things. We got this, like from how do we use that? That part is taken care of. And it has all the same benefits of everything else. Now, is it carbon positive? No, you have to understand one core aspect. We do not need what we call zero carbon. We exhale carbon dioxide, that's not an issue. Problem is we started to basically add new carbon dioxide that basically Earth's ecosystem was like, you know, stored away. It's like that's excess carbon dioxide. How about we store it away? We are pulling that back. Basically the poop of Earth, we are putting back into the ecosystem. Poop of the body that was outside, we are put pumping the poop inside the body. That's not healthy. So that's the problem. So carbon itself is not a problem. So you do not have to think about we need zero carbon. No. What we need is carbon neutral, meaning we are not adding new carbon, we are not removing carbon. Again, you can remove it if you have added surplus like we have did, but it's not an issue. It's not something poisonous. So this goes from carbon positive, like fossil fuel goes to carbon neutral, meaning it's directly running on solar energy to chemical energy. That's what you're doing. Now, Mark 1 biofuels try to use farmland, for example, corn. Again, uh, dumb politicians, uh, they literally mandated 10% uh, ethanol mix in uh, basically fuel. Now, problem with that is that corn is energy negative, meaning every time somebody did the mathematics with corn, it's like how much energy do we gain of mining, uh, you know, making, growing the crops and all. It's negative, meaning if you are getting five units of energy out of, you know, making this, it's consuming six units to make it, meaning you are consuming extra energy from coal industry when you are, you know, doing the industrial process, consuming fossil fuel just to make that damn thing. So it's energy negative. Why the heck government is still letting go? Again, politicians. So that's one of those things. Now, sugarcane is a bit better. It's a bit more positive. It's like it will consume five units and it will give you 5.5 units of energy. Now, problem with that is like Brazil started to do this and they started to figure it out how to work this and they are destroying rainforest like there is no tomorrow. They're they are killing their own ecosystem, making their own crops more expensive, which has happened with US also. So this is one of those things that we cannot use land grown crops flat out. No, we cannot do that unless you want to starve your country. So. Good luck with that. And not to mention, there is not enough land. Even if you convert 100% of agricultural land of USA, you still won't have enough. 
So that's the problem. Land crops was Mark one. That was good trial. That's what what Henry Ford wanted to do. That's what uh, Rudolf Diesel wanted to. That was his inherent design. It's like, hey, vegetable oil was the primary fuel. There was no such thing as diesel back in that day. So basically, they figured out there was a byproduct of uh, you know fuel fermentation. It's like, hey, this has seen features as uh, like you know vegetable oil. We can use it. Ironic things happen. Mo uh, Model T actually could have used direct ethanol. We just bad things happen. So land crops, that was Mark 1, does not work. In modern consumption, it will destroy our ecosystem. We cannot use that. How about LG? Now, LG is what we classify as Mark 3. Now, it has the benefit of fastest yield, meaning in crop system, you will talk about yields in two months. This puppy, days. Every day it can give that. So given one hectare of land, this puppy can outperform anything known to man. So this is Mark 3 variant. Consequence, land is still a scarce resource, meaning we do not have infinite surface area. On top of that, they, this puppy requires fresh water. A lot of it. Like a lot, lot kind of fresh water. So that's one of the, because we understand what you are extracting out of, you are extracting CH, hydrogen. Hydrogen is coming from water, so you are consuming water. So it, it will consume insane amount of water. So it's one of those things that's like, you know, you have in long term, in large enough scale, this is also unsustainable. It's fast, it's quick, but it's not sustainable long term. So flat out at this point in time, all our biofuel implementation, real world, really used is harmful. Flat out, we cannot do this. Like flat out, we cannot end 100% of rainforest just so we can grow sugar cane onto it. And not to mention, it will destroy the soil also. So flat out, biofuel, good idea. Implementation, really poisonous. So how seaweed solves this issue? Well, surface area, that's the first thing. 70% of earth is covered in salt water. Now, if you have something that can use salt water directly, you do not need to run an RO plant on it. That solves majority of the problem. So seaweed can grow directly in sea. That's why we call it seaweed. Now, interesting aspect of it, there is no plant that comes close to the yield rate of the use puppy. Algae does go higher than that, but be mindful, algae requires fresh water. So that's an issue here. But if you are comparing this to let's like, sugarcane corn, this will be like bitch please. Don't even go like there is a zeros difference, like multiple zeros difference in terms of yield rate. It's not as fast as algae, but much faster. And not to mention surface area. You have the benefit of insanely large surface area. So that's the one uh, benefit of that. Now, here's the interesting part. This industry basically making algae, growing it and selling it for products, it's going on. Is going on right now there are many countries including india that are growing algae on an industrial scale like as in like hundreds of ton kind of scale and we are using it for products what kind of products i have provided a video down below you will be shocked that's my personal guarantee how much we use algae in from medicine to food to uh, basically uh, organic farming uh, basically boosters and all that jazz everything uses algae it's like the amount of algae we consume is ludicrous so we already know that like the pipeline is already sorted the only thing we have to solve is right now it's kind of very manual very small scale it's like uh, early days of farming where we were like you know farming manually with some cows and cattle and all that jazz that's not good enough we need tractors so what uh, creates the use of tractor large scale so basically the moment we go large scope we allow automation right now there are very few companies that are even trying to develop automated solutions which will allow us to go from one hectare of mining to 500 hectares right now we do not have that because scale is not there but economics has been sorted people are growing uh, algae people are selling it people are making profit there are farmers who are investing as little as twenty thousand thousand dollar and making as high as fifty thousand dollar in return so it's here it's real it's working now, so I have covered many technology in the Future Friday series, but most of the time I personally do not have any, you know, stakes in the game. This is one of those scenarios where I do have a stake in the game. If uh, our politicians become stupid enough, our engineers become dumb enough, where they're like, we got to use hydrogen, it will harm us. We have tried this long enough and physics does not lie. Physics is one of those things, yeah, no, physics does not lie. So flat out, there is nothing, there is nothing that can solve all the problems that we are facing right now. This just requires government subsidy. Same way 10% was subsidized from ethanol if that subsidy was thrown out. And they're like, okay, we will not mix fuel. We just want to make the fuel rather than, you know, mixing. We just want to make the goddamn fuel. Which point fuel? This is another benefit. You can make heavy hydrocarbon. And in some scenarios, uh, many labs have already achieved what we call LG crude oil. Meaning you can take the crude oil, send it to an oil refinery and get the, all the products, including plastic. So we can achieve that. Government needs to subsidize that part and support it. Now, it will take some love from government because uh, right now the scale is hundreds of ton. We need to add few more zeros to that. That requires government love. So it has to be done. Now, once you start to reach what we call economy scale, it will allow automation. Once you have the automation, then at that point in time, we're gonna be talking about some serious fuel supply. Right now it's additive. Once we actually have large scale, then we have like, you know, 
we got this and you may be like how about what amount of surface area is going to consume serious amount of surface area let's not get around that it will consume hilariously large amount of surface area meaning 10 kilometer to hundreds of kilometer here's the deal we have hundreds of kilometer which we are not utilizing so that's there and imagine it this way let's say um, european union is working their ass off on it usa is working their ass on it uh, you know india is working their ass off on it let's say we somehow push through we make it work we start to utilize it what's then now once we start to overproduce this meaning every country is working their house off to make that remove dependency be like an independent we can overproduce it now like why would you want to do that here's deal it's the perfect way of carbon capture meaning you do not have to do anything you just keep overproducing it and once you have overproduced it, you convert it into crude oil you can basically take hydrocarbon and make it into heavier hydrocarbon chain pump it back into the oil wells that are on land and you know for a fact that they can stay there forever because well they were there forever so that's a perfect carbon capture. It's basically undoing the damage we did. And the energy consumption of the process will come from the sun. So we do not have to worry about it. It's just, there is no side effect from this. Now, some people have uh, pointed out that it will drain the nutrition of that area. But again, if you are cycling it properly, that's not an issue. On top of that, even if you're not cycling, you can just move. We have more than enough surface area and more than enough natural circulation of nutrition that it will not be an issue. Basically, you are mining, let's say, 100 square, uh, square kilometer here. Then you moved, like after two, three seasons, you're noticing your yields going down. You move to another. It's liquid. It's water. We are floating on top of it. It can be moved very easily. Then you here, let it replenish. How we do crop rotation, same thing can be done. And if you are cycling it properly with proper recycling, then it's not even an issue. So it's one of those things that can run aircraft, cars, trucks, everything without any issue it goes from carbon positive to carbon neutral and if you really push through it carbon negative also because we can start uh, like you know making crude oil and putting it back into the ground so tech is proven that's the interesting part of it. every aspect of this tech is proven at this point in time economy needs more love so what all our engineers and scientists are doing they are trying to make the lipid content much higher lipid content right now is as around 20 percent if they make it 40 percent it will bitch slap right now fossil fuel like that's what the aim is if they achieve 50 percent the end fossil fuel the ends meaning every country that is wasting money on ethanol wasting money on evs wasting money on anything other than this is just wasting time i do understand if you are a country that does not have sea border but as india china and usa which mind you is the majority of earth's population uh, three largest populated country if we take care of this situation we are saving the earth and not to mention also cleaning microplastic from the sea as an added bonus so that's why it is one of those situations that is a must. It's almost a miracle situation. It just requires a bit more elbow grease and large scale. Really, really large scale. So this was my presentation of LG uh, seaweed biofuel. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike. Press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.